A reading from Mark's Gospel, the seventh chapter beginning in the 24th verse. Listen for God's word. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet, he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him. And she came and bowed down at his feet. Now, the woman was of, was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Jesus said to her, let the children be fed first. For it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened. His tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What images come to your mind when you hear the word, Lockdown. I suppose for many of us this week, it reminds us of the lockdown at several schools following the horrible tragedy at Mount Tabor High School this past week. I'm sure many of you, like me, followed that story live as we saw several schools go into lockdown, and we continue to pray for the for the educators and, and the parents and the students and children there. And a horrible, horrible tragedy. Or maybe the word lockdown for you conjures images of this pandemic we have been going through for the last year and a half. Perhaps it reminds you of all the many places that were closed that were locked down literally. And the many that have struggled to even reopen. But it's really, it's really another kind of lockdown that I want to talk to you about today. And I think this one is impacting a lot of people. It's the lockdown of our souls. Events like the school shooting, the pandemic, the hurricane in Louisiana, the crisis in Afghanistan, and on and on and on. All of this bad news begins to to build up in our lives. And then it gets coupled with with our own personal issues, the things we are having to deal with in our day-to-day lives. Perhaps that's illness or or family problems or, or financial distress, whatever they may be. And sooner or later, our bodies 
in our minds, and yes, even our souls go into lockdown mode. It's like we, we, we just want to, to hunker down. We just want to be left alone, just, just want to no longer have to hear all the bad news over and over and over. As one of my clergy colleagues said the other day on face, Facebook, my gas tank of caring is on empty. What are we to do? What are we to do about this situation? How do we get our souls unlocked. Well, as usual, Jesus has an answer. And if you want to understand how this works, you can read text like Mark 7. You know, when we first look at it, it's, it's sort of a common encounter in the life of Jesus. A, a woman comes to Jesus to have her daughter healed, and a deaf man is brought to Jesus to have his speech and hearing restored. We see things like this all through the Gospels, right? But if we read it closely, there are some other rather interesting things going on here. For example... One finds a strange element in both of these healing accounts. Verse 24 tells us that Jesus entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. And verse 33 says, before he healed the deaf man, he took him aside, away from the crowd. Biblical scholars call this tendency of Jesus to, to keep everything quiet, the messianic secret. It runs throughout the Gospel of Mark. Jesus seems to be avoiding the public attraction that his healings might create. And to us that may seem like a, a strange approach for one who is wanting to draw the world to himself. But you see, Jesus is a different kind of Messiah. He is not a Messiah who is seeking his, his own renown and celebration. Jesus does not promote his, his status through public spectacle. In his book, The Name of Jesus, Henry Nouwen confesses three temptations that many honest Christian leaders face. He says that leaders want to be relevant, spectacular, and powerful. Interestingly, Jesus' temptations in the desert in Matthew 4 forced him to stand against all three of these enticements. But as Savior, as Messiah, he would not establish himself through the, the spectacular and powerful miracles, but instead through death. He would bid the crowds cling to his cross for soul healing. He suspected that they were attracted to him because they thought he might work a miracle for them and set them free. But he was a Messiah of humility and would draw it from those who wanted to follow him. But the really, really interesting idea here in this text for me are the tools that Jesus uses to unlock these two people. To unlock the Syrophoenician woman and the deaf man. Because understand, for both of them, encountering a Jewish religious leader was probably not something they would have been looking forward to. 
We talked about the Pharisees last week and their attitudes about cleanliness and so forth. Both of these individuals fall into the world of the unclean. In other words, when they encounter Jesus, perhaps their souls were a little bit locked. Or maybe not. We can see this in what happens here. The tools that Jesus uses to unlock these people. In fact, now listen to this. Sometimes the tools that Jesus uses to unlock our souls actually reside in us. As they reside in the Syrophoenician woman and the deaf man. It's just that Jesus draws them out. We can see these tools in our text today. I want to look briefly at them and use them as examples of what Jesus can do our lives when our souls are locked and how he might go about the process of unlocking them. The first tool we notice here is honesty. We have to have an honest understanding of our real and deep and fundamental need for Jesus. We have to be honest about where we are. You know, one of the funny things in the gospel is that Jesus always seems to attract messy people. He doesn't seem to attract these people who, are, who have everything together. Instead... He attracts these messy people, these people who are not in denial. These are not people who think they're not sick or that they're not possessed or they're not needy. They know they need help. They know they can't do it on their own, and they know they need this help right away. They have a genuine, honest clarity about their condition and situation. Now, the Syrophoenician woman is about as honest as they come, but she has three strikes against her. She is a woman, she is a Gentile, and she has a demon-possessed daughter. Now, none of these things won first-century popularity contests. And being physically imperfect, the deaf man would have been marginalized by his socio-religious culture as well. In fact, many people in those days thought that someone like this man, someone who was sick, well, that happened for a reason. God was punishing him, you see. And let me tell you, there are still those who think that way today. And they're wrong. Now this woman, she's heard about Jesus. And the deaf man and his friends must have heard as well. They'd heard that he was a healer and a need meter, and they have evident needs. They are willing to admit their needs, and these needs are the very thing that makes them attracted to Jesus. So the first question for us is this. Are we honest about where we stand? When we encounter Jesus, do we say, oh, I'm fine, (laughs) really, nothing to worry about? Even when we are worn down and broken and our souls locked, we must be honest about where we stand. The second tool we see here is humility. This woman had a humble spirit. The Gentile woman comes and bows at Jesus' feet, begging him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And then we get Jesus' response. And let's face it, it's not very nice, is it? Could have played with that one for a while in the sermon, too. Because Jesus says this, let the children be fed first. And she's not talking about the lady's little girl. 
For it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. Now this woman is a Gentile. She is an outsider. This is what Jesus is saying. He makes reference to being the Messiah for the Jews as God's children over and above the dogs as the Gentiles were often scornfully called. Now, I don't pretend to know what's going on here. Perhaps Jesus is testing her faith. Perhaps he is setting her up for a chance to, to, to level the playing field between the Jews and the Gentiles, similar to the way he eliminated clean and unclean food items last week. But either way, note how the woman responds. She responds with a humble spirit instead of being angry and defensive. She is contrite. She might be a cultural dog, but she will gladly accept that position if it means being fed what she seeks. Bernard of Clairvaux says, It is only when humility warrants it that great graces can be obtained. And so when you perceive that you are being humiliated... Look on it as the sign of a sure guarantee that grace is on the way. Just as the heart is puffed up with pride before its destruction, so it is humiliated before being honored. So what about us? When we approach Jesus, do we do so? In humility, we are taught to hide our weaknesses. We are taught to not expose or let anyone see our vulnerabilities. We're taught that we are supposed to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps, put our best foot forward. But if that's all we ever do, then our hidden needs can never be met. David Garland puts it this way. Pride stiffens the knees so that they will not bow down. Pride muzzles our voice so that we do not call out in humble supplication. The Gentile mother both bows down and cries out on behalf of her daughter. Her approach to Jesus is humble and broken. The third tool is faith. The woman responds in faith. The bravado of the woman's response to Jesus proves that she knows whom she is encountering. Jesus heals, and nothing will stop her from being faithful to that knowledge. In the same story in Matthew 15, Jesus responds to her by saying, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. In healing the deaf man, Jesus puts his fingers into his ears as a symbol of opening them. He spits and then touches the man's tongue as a symbol of loosening it. After healing him, the master bids him and his friends to remain quiet. But look at the response of the deaf man and his friends. The healed tongue won't stop running. Ironically, their disobedience to Jesus' request show, shows how much faith they have in him. They were astounded beyond measure and proclaim what he had done zealously. Today, our culture values faith in ourselves, faith in politics and politicians, faith in technological advances, faith in money and its security, but it never promotes faith like a child. Friends, do we 
actually believe that God is at work in our lives, in the life of this church, in the world around us? Do we have faith in God? Both the woman and the man were honest about themselves and their situation. Their spirit was humble before Jesus. Their response was faith. While the circumstances of their stories may be different from ours, Jesus operates the same today as then. He still unlocks the souls of messy people when their honesty drives them to humility and faith in him. Our needs may be varied. An outsider to Jesus needs reconciliation. A person with daunting, hidden sin needs freedom. One suffering from pain in the past needs healing. A struggling relationship needs honesty. An uncertain future needs hope. But when we are honest about our needs... Our spirit is humbled, and our response is faith. Then Jesus uses those tools to open and unlock our souls. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.